Artificial intelligence is being deployed at pace to help solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. I'm Alex Harvey, Macquarie CFO, and I'm very excited to introduce Sarah Menka, founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence. Grow Intelligence has built a unique AI-powered decision engine that seeks to address the twin challenges of climate change and food security. Grow was recently named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential Companies for its work empowering governments and companies with actionable data in these critical areas. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Alex. So we had the pleasure of working together in your former life as a commodities trader. I thought we might start if you could just tell us a bit about your story and how it's developed from there and, and particularly how Grow came about. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, my background was in commodities trading. I started my career off at Morgan Stanley actually trading energy, um, so not sort of on the agricultural side, but as an energy options trader, I had seen firsthand really the transformation that better access to data, knowledge and information brought to markets. Um, and, and the way that I sort of, the analogy I give there is, when I first started trading energy markets, having an oil producer or gas producer come out and hedge two years forward was very difficult to produce, you know, to sort of develop an asset because the market was not liquid enough. By the time I left, people could come out and do 10, 15, 20 year hedges. That allowed for much longer term capital allocation. And that meant that it funded a lot of innovation. So things that we take for granted today, like shale oil, shale gas, mm. renewable energy, all of that required a lot of sort of capital. And I had seen while I was trading energy and then started looking at investing in agriculture on a personal basis, how difficult it was to make sort of the economics work, no matter really where in the world you were, but particularly in parts of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, where mm. there's an abundance of land and arable land and really cheap land, but somehow yields are low and sort of not enough investment dollars were flowing in. And, it became very clear to me that we needed to build a company that would be the infrastructure to enable that, right? So to, to sort of enable efficiency across the system to be able to transfer um, long-term sort of risk, but also to create a baseline of understanding, which just didn't seem to mm. exist. Mm. What I sort of hadn't appreciated um, back when I left to start Grow Intelligence was that by sort of choosing to address this in through, through sort of through the agricultural lens was that agriculture sits at this really inter interesting intersection between sort of our Earth's ecology and sort of the preservation of it, as well as sort of economic growth. Mm. And so to build sort of a platform that was this decision engine, we were you know, to get it right, to model the supply side, we had to ingest a lot of sort of environmental and ecological and climate data and to model demand, we had to sort of ingest a lot of economic data. Mm -hmm. And what I hadn't appreciated was that this agricultural platform would then contribute both economic and ecological signals sort of back to the world. So it was sort of a natural progression, yeah. but it was, that that's sort of how we got here. That's great. It's amazing, um, Sarah, just how fragmented the agricultural sector is around the world, and how much of a challenge we face as a planet with food security. Yeah, and I, and I would almost break food security into two parts, which is food security for today and then food security for the future. Mm. And those are also in some ways similar, but also face different challenges, mm. right? So if we think about sort of food security for today, and I, you know, I think it was, we're, 2021. Now I want to say 2020, but we're in 2021 now. <laughs> and, yeah. um, in 2017, in sort of, frankly, the early days of the company in many ways, we had said and projected that sort of a food crisis was less than a decade away. Yeah. And we were hearing all sorts of arguments around the fact that, you know, you're exaggerating, are you just a doomsday type person or all of these things, but it was actually sort of the structural shift that we were seeing coming, which was gonna be demand driven, mm. and that the system did not have the capacity to structurally fix itself, to fix the supply side for the very reason I described, the fact that we have lots of arable land, mm. but we don't have capital flowing to it in the right ways to sort of drive production and productivity up. And so short term, you know, what we're facing from a food security standpoint was last year, COVID 
last year was a very weird year for food markets because, you know, oftentimes in sort of agriculture and food, you say you face a lot of supply shocks. The supply shocks tend to come in one or two regions of the world and they disrupt supply, but you don't have a demand shock. Mm. Last year you had supply shocks in almost every part of the world. There were supply shocks in the US, there were supply shocks in South America, sort of the two largest agricultural economies in the world. Mm -hmm. And then you had demand shocks everywhere in the world where at the beginning of 2020, everybody thought the demand shocks were sort of temporary, right? Mm -hmm. And then temporarily they were downwards because people stopped driving, ethanol demand went down, um, you know, and then people were hoarding particular types of food. There were supply chain disruptions, mm -hmm. but then you had sort of the supply, um, the supply shocks continuing throughout the year. And then you had sort of demand continue to rise mm -hmm. and it was not a one-time shock. It was sort of much more of what we were predicting, right? And so in the short term, the challenges around food security are just driven by the fact that prices of food around the world have frankly skyrocketed, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. whether it's protein or grains or oil seeds, it's pretty much across the entire complex. Mm. And so for net importing countries, which is most of, you know, most of Southeast Asia, East Asia, China in particular, Sub-Saharan Africa, et cetera, you, were have, you, you have sort of rampant sort of inflation yeah. Yeah. in food prices just because of import needs. But then places like Brazil and Russia and Argentina that are net exporters have currency crises yeah. that are causing inflation in sort of very different ways. And so you just have this extreme, extremely shocked system yeah. that has a lot to work through. Um, in sort of the long term, food security is much more tied to climate change. Yeah. And long term food security is a lot more around asking questions of are the places where we're getting our foods from the same places that are going to be suitable to grow yeah. these foods yeah. and these crops? Yeah. And how are sort of our trade patterns going to shift? Right. So that is it's it's sort of much bigger picture, but just as important a question to start mm. thinking about now mm. in the context of climate change, mm. which I think has presented to us that it is very real. <laughs> One of the things that um, you know, we've chatted about um, before, Sarah, but I wanted to maybe have you share for the audience is you, you built a incredibly diverse, capable team of people actually um, behind Grow. Um, and one of the things you've said before is that you know, artificial intelligence is, is only as good as the human intelligence sitting behind it and grows, obviously. The way you built the company, I think, is a great example of that. How do you view the relationship between that human expertise that's sitting in the company and and the data and technology capability that, uh, that we now have and that you've now built? Yeah, I mean, I would, you know, I say there are two types of technology companies in general. And one is not necessarily better than the other, but almost being a non-technical founder mm. was a gift to me because I started with a problem where technology was a solution yeah. to that problem, as opposed to a cool technology that needed to find yeah. a problem, a problem to, solve. to solve. Yeah. And so because it started with how do we solve a problem, it meant it was about surrounding myself and building a team of domain experts yeah. that could help define it, <laughs> that could help answer some pretty basic questions around it. Yeah. And yeah. then it was like, oh, technology is a solution, data as a solution. Um, and we need to architect that. It was then about finding sort of the right data engineers, machine mm -hmm. learning experts, mm -hmm. AI engineers, et cetera, to bring into the team mm -hmm. and then getting them and bringing them out of industries that have nothing to do with the domains we were dealing with oftentimes and getting them to speak about one another. And I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough in sort of talking about artificial intelligence is the importance of this human component. Mm. And I think it's one of sort of the greatest missed opportunities, but also frankly, the greatest challenges that a lot of tech companies today face, which is, you know, when we say we're generating AI doctors, is are we really generating AI doctors or are we generating AI doctors that are going to be capable of treating a very yeah. particular demographic yeah. that yeah. is oftentimes represented that the demographic that's feeding it that data? That's cool. Tell me, um, tell me a bit about more about the team, Sarah, if, if, if we can. Just, you know, I know it's an incredibly diverse team and, and you know, 
back to the point we were talking about before, it's quite a fragmented sector and, and a really global sector, agriculture as well. But how have you, how have you sort of built the, the team behind, behind Grow and, and what's their backgrounds? And you know, just talk a bit about the diversity of that team. Yeah, and in some ways it links very closely with the data and the fragmentation you talk mm. about, right? So energy has the benefit of being highly consolidated because it's so expensive to produce. Mm. It's also highly regulated and highly regulated markets tend to have standard standards set by regulators for what is expected of them. So the even if the data was hard to find back in the day, it was actually regulated, so mm. it was there. Agriculture is like you can have a half acre farm or a hundred thousand acre farm. It's also tens of thousands of different products. So the first was finding a team that understood the different components of agriculture, yeah. whether it was fresh produce or protein or oil seeds or grain or yeah. dairy or, you know, all of those bits. But then it was also saying, well, if what we're trying to do is build a model that can forecast that, well, the supply side is much more sort of about, um, as I said, ecology. Yeah. So then it was like finding environmental scientists and plant biologists and sort of, you know, people who understood the science behind the growth. And on the demand side, it was about markets and economy. So it was about bringing in economists and former traders of these markets that could sort of help model that behavior. Mm. So on one side mm. of the equation, that's sort of the team. But then a lot of this data also, as you said, is not only fragmented, it comes in local languages. Mm, mm. So the other component we had to think of as a company is how many native speakers of different languages can we have anywhere in the company? <laughs> exactly. Because the first part of data ingestion and sort of standardization includes humans manually doing it so an AI can be trained to do the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of that human expertise part matters. So language, we decided, let's just optimize across the company. Let's not try to make sure that we were finding a poultry person that spoke six languages that was going to be impossible. So it was like, let's just optimize for languages. And then there was sort of the translation, which is more product. So you then need sort of a product team that can sort of say, this is the commercial need and here's how we map it to engineering. And then within engineering, you're talking about engineers that deal with sort of large volumes of data sets on the back end and can ingest it to yeah. people who can sort of interpret and make it available. And so it's very wide. And then you sort of have to deliver it to clients in a particular way, which is visual. So we actually have a visual design team and a writing team. So we actually have artists in house, right? So it's really just a mix of everything. Um, and That's we always a, say there's not one type of brony. It's a, it's a great case study in just the power of diversity and then creating an environment. I know you've spent lots of time doing this, creating an environment where everyone feels like they've got something to contribute to what is a really big problem. So it's uh, really interesting to hear you talk about the background of, uh, background of the team. Maybe just um, switching tax a little bit. Um, how are you using the platform? And obviously the original intention of the Grow platform was all around food security. And, and that's now kind of, I guess, morphed or at least been, you know, you've added to um, the, the challenge or the problem for Grow to, to help try and understand and address climate change. How, how, do you, how do you bring those two things together? Yeah. Um, as like I said, you know, because agriculture was at the, the intersection of sort of the Earth's ecology and our human economy, we had 25,000 environmental and climate data sets in the system already just to model agriculture. <laughs> but the thing is, temperature is temperature, rainfall is rainfall, floods mm -hmm. are floods, drought is drought. And the definition of that really doesn't change whether you're referring to farmland or a building mm -hmm. or oil rigs or whatever it is, right? So sort of a subset of the models we we built around indexing specific climate risks, trying to do it just to model agriculture, mm. those had applications sort of well beyond, right? And so we um, we sort of have done two things, which is, and, and by the way, we're doing the same on the economic side because things like our food price indices that monitor food prices real time around the world are really good proxies for inflation yeah, monitoring yeah, right. real time, yeah. right? So it's sort of the contribution to the, and so the, the contribution to the climate change side is much bigger because of just the scale of the problem and also the complexity of the challenges yeah. of optimizing 30, 50 years out. And really what we've done is we've taken a portion of the GROW platform, which are just these sort of climate indices that we have, we've built and said, what if we replace farmland with buildings. Yeah. And what if we use that as measuring the risk to 
how heating and cooling requirements yeah. will change the buildings. And then what if we change that and said, how would we look at a real estate portfolio, any portfolio, and look at how that translates to cost, future energy costs, and then how does that relate to carbon footprint? All of a sudden, you can have a retailer feed our system, you know, 10,000 retail locations around the world, and they've made a net zero commitment. It'll be really helpful to know if, you know, retrofitting the right thousand buildings would get you 80% of the way there yeah. versus yeah, figuring yeah. out where does, where does one start. Uh, maybe just, just finally, you've been uh, on the tech entrepreneurial journey now for, uh, for several years. What have been the key inflection points in terms of developing technologies and commercialising them? And how do you see the story evolving, the growth story evolving from here? I would say the first one is refusing to fit a pattern that people wanted us to fit in the early days, because I think, you know, you're always sort of ultimately have to fund this somehow. Yeah. And I always say investors, and by the way, as a trader, I, I say this, like you make money by recognizing patterns. And if something doesn't fit a pattern, it's how do you, and you're kind of taking a bet, right? So it, one was sort of sticking to that gut reaction in sort of the early days. Yeah. Um, and sort of saying, let, let's build this as a holistic system. Because yeah. the other part was there was a temptation to say, do we just model US corn correctly and just stop there? Or do you, do you try to sell one model at a time when the whole challenge was modeling this very complex real world system, which would be a very difficult technical challenge? Mm. And, Sort of technology, meaning the broader tech ecosystem was on our side in terms of compute and ingestion of mm. data and the mm. cost of doing that sort of going down. So the trend was on our side and being able to do it cheaper and cheaper every year. Mm -hmm. um, we had nothing to do with that, but we were sort of participants in the mm. market and benefiting <laughs> from that. And, and the second, I would say, point of inflection was sort of as hard as sort of navigating difficult situations were is, and, and so I would say the uncertainty I felt as CEO mm. in March and April of last year was okay. unlike any other, yeah. was sort of sticking to sort of my data driven, but still in some ways trusting instinct yeah. that climate was not going to be a less important topic because we had this pandemic yeah. that we were dealing with. And there were a lot of people saying, gosh, like, do you just want to wait a little bit? And I said, no, and now's our time to build. Yeah. And, I, and I felt that that time as, like, just if I look at my calendar, not getting on planes, not like it allowed sort of a whole new level yeah, of innovation completely. to occur. Yeah, completely. Um, and sort of we leveraged that. So I would say those were, you know, and, those are two. And if you if you sort of project it out five or 10 years, I mean, I know, uh, I know that sounds relatively short term, Sarah. Maybe I should ask you 50 years, but anyway, five to 10 years time, <laughs> where, where where will Grow be? Where, where, where do you think where do you think the company will be? Where where will be on this? Where will we be on this journey? Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, I always say I never know what this platform is going to tell us and what it's going to let us hmm. do. And the reason is that's sort of the power of the platform. Hmm. And one of the things that's becoming clear is that many different businesses and models, business models will emerge from growth. So mm. climate as an asset class is one of them. It's just leveraging a tiny part of the platform, but can sort of launch an entire, we're launching an entirely new business on mm. it. Mm. And so to me in sort of five to 10 years, we're an enabler of an ecosystem of companies, not just grow companies, but other companies that might just be entirely built on grow as sort of infrastructure that solve for these challenges as we start to understand what these signals and what this data mm. enables us to do. And as sort of that data gets richer, we'll, we'll see it. So for me, my job is gonna be to find sort of the right people to say, okay, great, go. And then go find sort of the next <laughs> next inflection point and the next inflection point. But I, I would say that's sort of where we are. It's really amazing to hear you, even in those final comments, I suppose, Sarah, connecting this idea of human capability with the the data analytics, the artificial intelligence, the compute power that uh, that's, I guess, much more available to all of us today. Uh, that's been fantastic. Obviously, um, grows an amazing story. And I think that the vision that you have and, and that your team has for dealing with the issues of food security and, and then the impact of climate change on our on our food securities is an amazing story. And we really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to spend with us today. And, 
look forward to seeing how the story unfolds over the uh, over the coming months and years. So thanks very much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me, Alex.